Hi, I wanted to start by uh, reviewing some of the types of questions that you should expect about research studies on the exam. These are both questions that you might expect about specific research articles that we've talked about, and also kinds of questions you might want, you might expect to get about how to do research or how to test a particular idea related to things that we've talked about um, in the class um, outside of the context of research studies. Um, so for example, um, I might ask you how you would uh, figure out whether a particular uh, neurotransmitter inhibits the release of another neurotransmitter. You might have to design an experiment very much along the lines of uh, this fourth uh, idea here. Um, uh, as is illustrated on the topics guide and shown here on the screen, there are four main types of questions regarding research papers or experimental designs that you might see, and these can sort of mix and match from different experimental uh, experiments. The example here from the topics guide is actually a paper that we haven't talked about and aren't going to talk about, um, but I do want to use that paper because it actually allows me to discuss in more abstract terms how you should be thinking about research articles without tying it to some specific article that we have already discussed or will already discuss. So I'm just going to really quickly first go over the article that, that this is about. Um, this is something that's about ADHD and particularly something called transgenerational transmission of hyperactivity in a mouse model of ADHD. Um, and essentially what the researchers did is they took a pregnant female mouse and gave her a ton of nicotine. Not, not a ton, a very large amount of nicotine. Um, consistent with previous studies, all of her babies came out hyperactive. The thing that they did then, which was new, is to wait until those babies grow up and then have those babies have kids with other mice. Um, in particular, the, the daughters that she had had um, uh, mated with um, control males that were not hyperactive, had never experienced drugs prenatally or anything like that, um, and then um, and then they looked at uh, the children that came from this cross. They also took the males, these hyperactive males from this uh, female, when these males grew up, they mated with um, non-hyperactive, non-drug exposed females, and they looked at the, the, the children that came from this um, uh, cross. What they found is that um, for, indeed, the the grandchildren, so these are the children here, these are the grandchildren on the female side, and then actually one more generation of females, the great-grandchildren on the female side, all are hyperactive. However, on the male side, there is not hyperactivity. Um, what this led them to conclude is that there must be some sort of what's called epigenetic change. That's something that's beyond the scope of this course, um, but is something that you can certainly look up. Um, so the question they asked is, how does prenatal nicotine exposure affect, affect um, behavior in children and grandchildren, and how does that depend on whether we're following along the female line or the male line? Um, the manipulation is to give a pregnant female a bunch of nicotine and then observe uh, um, and then um, and then have her children and grandchildren. Um, uh, make babies of their own with um, non-exposed partners. Um, the um, measurement is activity. So these graphs down here are just measuring how active these babies are, how active these little mice are. Um, the observation is that the children have more activity than controls. The grandchildren on the female side have more activity than controls. The great-grandchildren, again, continuing along the female-only lines, um, have more activity than controls. Um, but And then the sons, while they are hyperactive, their children, so the grandchildren of this original female along the male line, are not hyperactive. Those are the observations. And then the conclusions, uh, those are the results, and then the conclusions um, have to do with this epigenetics material that we don't need to worry about right here. Okay, so how does this translate to questions that I might ask you on an exam? Um, there are a few different questions that I might ask you. Um, the first kind of question is a factual summary. That is just asking you to 
explain the paper to me. These questions are deceptively hard. In order to get full credit, you have to clearly explain the question, the manipulation and comparison groups, the measurements, what are actually being observed, um, what is actually a visible measurement. So for example, you cannot visibly observe genetic or epigenetic changes. You can visibly observe mouse behavior. The result, which again is a visible thing, it is something that um, actually in comparing the two groups, we need to know what our comparison group is and what we're measuring, and then once we've got our comparison group and our measurement, then we see is are the two groups, or three groups or whatever, different in that measured variable. That's the result. And then finally our conclusion. The conclusion is what we think it all means. Those are the main questions that you absolutely need to know about every research article or about every single experiment that I ask you to design um, or any experiment that I ask you to interpret. Um, always those five questions. What's the scientific question? What are the manipulations and comparison groups? What are the measured variables? What are the results? Specifically, are those measured variables the same or different? Um, and what is the conclusion and interpretation? There is a more extensive list, our earlier up on the topics guide, of more things that you should know about every single research article. If you work through all of these, then you will have a very deep understanding of all of the research articles, and I strongly advise you to work through all of these on every research article that we're discussing in this class. Um, but at a minimum, you absolutely need to have those five things for every single research article, these ones listed here. There's only one new article for this unit. Um, please, please make sure you have a very solid understanding of what was done in that. Um, note also, by the way, that often um, an article might have multiple experiments. For example, the Welsh SAPAP3 paper had four different experiments in them in it. So you need to know the answer to our five questions for each of those four experiments. Um, and that is where you should be using Piazza. That is where you should be emailing me um, your summaries of what you think you need to know. Um, and that is um, uh, uh, what you should be doing to prepare for this test. All right, so that's our first type of question, factual summary. Our second type of question, which is also deceptively hard, is something called counterfactual data. So in this, I say, okay, yes, in reality what they found is that along the female line, the, um, the uh, hyperactivity was inherited, even though these grandchildren and great-grandchildren were never exposed to nicotine. But on the male line, the hyperactivity is not inherited. The counterfactual data means non-factual data. So a what if a different result had happened? For example, I might say, what if things had been a little different and instead the male line is where the um, hyperactivity had continued? So for this, again, you need to know about the conclusions. In particular, I guess what we need to know is that the conclusion they drew is that there is an epigenetic change that is inherited along, um, in eggs but not sperm. So the, um, the different conclusion that you would come to here is that there would be an epigenetic change that is inherited in sperm but not eggs if it followed the male line rather than the female line. Um, that's relatively straightforward, but what it does is it tests your ability to think about the relationship between results and conclusions by giving you new results that are different from the actual results and asking you to give, tell me what the modified conclusion would be. The third kind of question is to interpret a related experiment. There were some practice questions about this that I told you you could largely ignore, um, but um, there's one given here, which based on what I've said so far just about that paper, you should be able to mostly work out. And that is, um, uh, I, here I would tell you a related experiment and ask you to predict some results 
or give me an interpretation. So in this case, I'm saying, um, imagine that we have prenatal exposure to morphine and that causes early onset Alzheimer's disease in mice. Um, when you look along the matrilineal, the female line, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they also have early onset Alzheimer's disease, even if they don't have morphine exposure. How would you interpret this? Well, I mean, that is, again, um, if, uh, I mean, you, we're not going to have epigenetics questions on our exam, um, but uh, again, you would have to describe something along the lines of something that lines up with, with, um, with the, um, the, the paper. Um, one place where we saw that in particular um, was back on exam one. Um, one of the questions that was quite difficult for a lot of people was question two, where I'm asking you about schizophrenia. And I say, um, okay, so we're looking at schizophrenia, and um, we, did, we did one experiment with single action potentials. We find that the synapses are weaker in the parietal lobe. Um, and then how would you figure out whether this is pre or postsynaptic? To figure this out, you need to go back to the, you basically need to go to the Welch study, the fourth experiment in the Welch study, where they talked, where they did paired pulses, two pulses instead of one. Um, actually, the next video that I'm going to make will be about that. Um, but, um, and then just in that, then just describe that study, but in, instead of talking about OCD, you just substitute in the word schizophrenia. Instead of talking about um, uh, visual system inputs, uh, or sorry, instead of talking about orbital frontal inputs to the basal ganglia, we're now talking about visual system inputs into the parietal lobe. Um, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. We're looking at paired pulse ratios and, um, and listing out the possible cases. So, um, so in these questions where I ask you to interpret a related experiment, you need to figure out what the related experiment is and then um, interpret it. Um, actually, there was a little bit of uh, the fourth type of question, which is proposing an experiment um, built into that as well. Because um, I, in that question to you from the exam, I didn't tell you to look at paired pulse ratios. Um, you had to come up with that on your own. Um, but in general, um, so, so, so our third type of experiment is maybe I tell you some data or I tell you part of an experiment and then you finish it out and give me an interpretation or you give me a few interpretations um, if you have a few possible results. Our fourth type of question is a little bit more open-ended. The fourth type of question is one where I, pose, I give you an interpretation, a hypothesis, a, a scientific idea, and I ask you to... Um, to give me a full experiment from start to finish that will test this idea. Um, and so <coughs> here we are saying, um, uh, actually we didn't talk about seizures yet in this class, but I would say, guess what? Alcohol uh, is a GABA receptor agonist. You should know what a GABA receptor agonist means. Um, uh, and there's this thing called a seizure. In this case, we kind of don't even really know, need to know what a seizure is, but a seizure happens if there's not enough GABA. So that's sort of, I'm telling you, alcohol is a GABA agonist, not enough GABA activity causes a seizure. Okay. Then I say your hypothesis, the idea you want to test, is that prenatal alcohol, giving a mom alcohol while she's pregnant, is going to increase the risk of offspring developing seizures. And then I say, describe an experiment. All right, so our hypothesis is given, which really kind of informs the question or sort of dictates the question, which is essentially what happens in, to seizure frequency in uh, animals that are um, where their mom is given alcohol during pregnancy compared to animals where the mom is not given alcohol during pregnancy, which actually also now starts to lead into our comparison groups. We have one set of mice that are pregnant and we give them alcohol. Another set of mice, while they're pregnant, we don't give them alcohol. Um, our, um, what we're going to measure is seizures. Um, let's just say that we can tell by looking at a mouse whether it's having a seizure. So we're just going to watch these mice while they grow up and count how many times they have seizures. That's our measurement. Um, then we get into 
our expected result. So if this hypothesis is right, what would you expect to happen? I'm not going to answer that. I'm you, should, um, if, uh, you should post an answer on Piazza to that, or actually just scroll down a little bit later to the sample answers um, on this same topics guide and uh, sort through that. Um, and then finally, and very importantly, explicitly explain, and this may seem exhausting and obvious, but explicitly explain how your result does support the original hypothesis. Um, so I guess I will say the, the, our result that we expect is that the babies with GABA, or sorry, the babies with, with uh, the, where their mom had alcohol during pregnancy have more seizures than the babies whose mom didn't have alcohol during pregnancy, um, and baby mice, and then, um, and then, uh, and then I would say explicitly, this supports the hypothesis because we have now, because we have demonstrated that alcohol during pregnancy um, increases the rate of seizures. I know that sounds like you're just repeating yourself, but it's very important to make an explicit, clear link between your observed result of more seizures in one set of animals versus another and your interpretation of alcohol in pregnancy causes seizures. Um, you don't observe the causation. You observe the seizures and then you infer the causation. And it's very important to make those inferences explicit and clear.